Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am Dr. Claudia Albers, Planet X researcher and professional physicist. And today I would like to discuss with you another one of my articles on brown dwarfs in the solar system. And this one is entitled Possibilities Regarding a Brown Dwarf Star's Position. So in this article, then, I'm going to discuss... Um, the possibility of calculating where a brown dwarf star is in the solar system. And in figure one, uh, it shows an image of an object that fits the profile of a brown dwarf star. It looks like an illuminated, fast rotating cloud of gas. The brown dwarf is an old star that has been convert that has converted all its fuel to iron and therefore has was only able to emit infrared radiation. But since it has entered the solar system, it has gained energy and protons from the sun and has been able to start fusion reactions on its surface and thus has become visible. The image on the right of figure 1 is an HI2 Shrem A image of the brown dwarf star. Notice that both images show that the brown dwarf star has a small circular center. This is probably where there is an opening in the ionized iron cloud surrounding the object, through which the actual surface of the brown dwarf star can be seen. Left, therefore, we have this image of a brown dwarf star. It looks like a cloud of ionized gas with an opening in it. The core of the star would be inside there. And here is uh, the object I have talked about in previous videos. Now, since the Stereo A spacecraft can keep the brown dwarf star within its field of vision all the time, whilst essentially following Earth's orbit, this suggests that the brown dwarf star is in orbit around the Sun, but finding its orbital radius is not easy. We would need more information than what has been available up to now. However, new information has come to light. Notice that the object on the left of figure 1 is seen in the night sky, since there is a black background around it. So we can see the black background here. The fact that this object is seen in the night sky means that it is beyond Earth's orbit around the Sun. And this is illustrated in figure 2. So here we have if the brown dwarf star is between the Sun and the Earth, it would be visible in the daylight sky. This is the part of the Earth that has daylight because it is facing the Sun. The other side is facing away from the Sun, so there would be a night sky there. And if the brown dwarf was in the sky then, so if it was a further away from the Sun, um, than the Earth or on the outside of Earth's orbit, it would be seen in the night sky. Now, some additional data has become available regarding a reversal in the direction of the solar wind, which is called a magnetopause reversal. This reversal happened on the outside of Earth's orbit around the Sun and has happened twice in 2016 on April 23rd and October 14th. Figure 3 shows the direction of the solar wind before the reversal occurred on October 14th. The direction of the solar wind is given by the direction of the arrows in the image. So the sun is over here. This is the Earth. It's a little uh, white circle. The solar wind direction is given by these arrows and it's all pointing in the correct direction, which is away from the sun. However, in figure 3, this is what we see. This is what's called a magnetopause reversal because over here, between the Sun and the Earth, we have the correct direction of the solar wind and outside of Earth's orbit, inside the magnetosphere, we have um, all the arrows pointing towards the Sun, which is in the opposite direction. And the only way that could be poss possible is if the Sun is interacting with another star, another star on outside of Earth's orbit, uh, probably having its own stellar wind or a particle flux transfer between the Sun and the star on the outside of Earth's orbit. Now, um, here we have a solar wind scope view in Figure 5 of the solar system on October 14, 2016 at 228, and it shows that if the Earth passed between the Sun and another star, this star would have been in the Pisces constellation. We have the Sun, we have the Earth. If we point uh, to the outside of Earth's orbit, we see that we are pointing towards the Pisces constellation.
There are several ways that this solar wind direction reversal can be interpreted. The first and simplest is to say that the Earth passed between the Sun and another star, which produces its own particle flux and was therefore able to counteract the Sun's particle flux or solar wind. If that is the case, this object would be in the constellation Pisces, as shown in figure 5. Now, figure 6 shows the magnetopause reversal of April 23, 2016. The reversal is not as dramatic as the October 14, 2016 reversal, uh, so the star must have been further away in April. However, there is actually no way of knowing for sure that it was the same object, but we are going to consider the possibility that it is and see what conclusions we can arrive at. So this is what happened on April 23rd. So you can see some of the arrows have reverse direction, but it's not nearly as dramatic as what we saw in uh, on October 14th. So um, let's see some reversals here. So it's a much smaller effect. Now figure 7 shows the solar system scope view on April 23, 2016 at 534. And we see that if the Earth passed between the Sun and another star at that time, then that star would have been in the Virgo constellation. That's the Virgo constellation there. Now, um, as I said before, we cannot be sure that it is the same object, but we are going to consider it. If it is the same object, it must be outside the Earth's orbit and is therefore unlikely to move fast enough to encounter the Earth on April 23rd and then again on October 14th, a time inter interval of 173 days. The reason for that is if an object orbits outside of Earth's orbit, it must have an orbital period that is greater than the Earth's orbital period of 365 days. And therefore, moving just halfway around its orbit would have been 182.5 days actually greater than 182.5 days. So 173 days that uh, it took um, would be impossible. Um, now, but there is the possibility that the object was not on the outside of Earth's orbit both times, but that an alignment between the Sun and the Earth and the star was the reversal. In that case, the magnetic flux change caused by the Earth's alignment with the Sun and the star would be enough to cause a reversal in the solar wind direction on the outside of Earth's orbit. If that is the case, the star would be outside the Earth's orbit for either one of the times, and on the opposite side of the solar system the other time. Since the effect is stronger on October 14th, we are going to assume that it was closest to Earth at that time, and on the other side of the solar system on April 23rd. Now this is illustrated in this figure. So we see this is uh, the star's position on April 23rd. At that time, the Earth was on the other side of the Sun. So all that happened was an alignment to cause the small reversal. However, on October 14th, the star um, was on the outside of Earth's orbit with the Earth between the Sun and that star. And so the star moved from here to there between April 23rd and October 14th. Now, if the star had not moved at all between the first reversal event and the second in 2016, we would expect the period of time between reversals to be half the, the orbital period of the Earth. So, if the star had stayed here, um, then the Earth would have been here on April 23rd, and it would have moved all the way to there 182.5 days, because that's a half of 365 days, the total orbital period of the Earth. But instead, the time period was 173 days. This means that the star moved by an angle equivalent to 9.5 days. In other words, the star moved a little bit this way, so that the Earth encountered it earlier than it would have had the star not moved. And this, we then need this angle, this angular displacement that the star went through in that time.
So this means that the star moved by an angle equivalent to 9.5 days of the Earth's orbit. In other words, the star's angular displacement was given by delta theta, which is equal to 2 pi times 9.5 days over 365 days, which is 0.1635 radians. And this was um, in a time period of 173 days. So the angular speed of the star was 0.1635 radians, the angular displacement, divided by the time period of 173 days. Then assuming that the star is orbiting the sun, we can, from the angular speed, estimate an orbital period, which is given by, well, t is the orbital period, 2 pi over the angular speed, um, which gives us 6.65 times 10 to the 3 days, or 5.74 times 10 to the 8 seconds. Then, once we have the orbital period, we can use the very useful Kepler's third law to estimate the star's orbital distance from the Sun. So, what we calculate is the semi-major axis A, which is equal to the cube root of gm over 4 pi squared times t squared, and that gives us 1.04 times 10 to the 9 kilometers, which translates into 6.9 AU. Uh, or 6.9 astronomical units. And remember, one astronomical unit is the distance between the Sun and the Earth. Now, G is the gravitational constant, M is the Sun's mass. And uh, if the star is the brown dwarf star visible in such images, then this orbital distance from the Sun would place it between the orbit of Jupiter and Saturn, and close to closer to the orbit of Jupiter than to Saturn's since Jupiter's orbital rate is 5 AU and Saturn's is 9 AU. This is Dr. Claudia Albers, Planet X physicist. Thank you for watching.